Hello, everybody, and welcome to this recorded version of Lecture 17 in MA283 Linear Algebra. So our theme today is diagonalizability of matrices or linear transformations and eigenvectors. And just to kick off on these topics, let's have a look back at last week's example, where we found that this 3 by 3 matrix A was similar to the diagonal matrix whose entries on the main diagonal are 2 minus 3, 7 and zeros everywhere else, of course. So in that situation, we say that A is diagonalizable, which means it is similar to a diagonal matrix. And just remember that the meaning of similar in this context is that we can multiply A on the left by some P inverse and on the right by some P, P and P inverse are inverses of each other, in order to get this diagonal matrix A dash. And so what it means geometrically is that the matrices A and A dash represent each other with respect to two different bases of R3, A with respect to the standard basis, and P with respect to the, and, and A dash with respect to the basis whose elements are the columns of P. Okay, so this, this relation of similarity basically means, that here, here is its algebraic description, and what it means is that two matrices, if they're similar to each other, describe the same linear transformation with respect to two different bases. And the reason why we are interested in this is because quite often, given some linear transformation, it may be that describing it with respect to one basis rather than another really reveals its geometric properties much more clearly. And also maybe has a very nice form for doing calculations with, such as for instance, being diagonal. Of course, if somebody were to hand you this matrix A and the diagonal matrix with entries two minus three, seven on the main diagonal, it is not immediately obvious at a glance that those two matrices are similar to each other. And indeed it is, it is a, not necessarily an easy thing to determine. Okay, so what we'll see today is that the columns of P in this situation are eigenvectors of the matrix A that we started with, corresponding to the numbers two minus three and seven as eigenvalues. And basically we are interested in the case where we can form a basis of R3 or whatever the space is, Rn, consisting of eigenvectors of some matrix. And that's exactly the situation where A is, where the matrix itself is similar to a diagonal matrix. So that's our, that's our topic for this lecture. Okay, so here are a couple of interpretations of this, of this situation. So bearing in mind P is this matrix, three by three. The columns of P are the vectors B1, B2, and B3, which are linearly independent and form a spanning set for R3. So they form a basis for R3. And A dash is the matrix with respect to the basis consisting of the three columns of P of the linear transformation, whose, which, which is defined as left multiplication by A. So what that means to say that A dash, which has entries two minus three, seven on the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else, what it means to say that that's the matrix with respect to this basis of a given transformation is that when we apply the transformation one zero four to one zero four, what we get is a vector whose coordinates with respect to B1, B2, B3 are the entries in the first column of A dash, namely two zero zero. So the effect of the transformation on the vector 104 is to just take that vector to two times 104 plus zero times each of the other two columns. So basically the effect of the transformation is just to multiply that vector by the scalar two. And similarly, the other two vectors in the basis get multiplied respectively by minus three and by seven when we apply the linear transformation to them. And this is quite a special thing. You know, if we have some basis and we apply some linear transformation to the first basis vector, we generally expect that the result would be some linear combination of the three basis vectors. We don't expect that it would just be a scalar multiple of the first one with zero coefficients for the other two. So when the matrix with respect to the given basis is diagonal, what that means is that each of the basis vectors has the property that applying the linear transformation to it just has the effect of multiplying it by a scalar. Not, not, not at all that any other vectors in the space would have this particular special property. Okay, so for this particular setup, let's just have a look at a couple of interpretations of it on the next slide here. So as I was just saying, the fact that A dash is a diagonal matrix with entries two minus three and seven on the main diagonal means that applying the transformation T to the, to the vector B1 just gives two times B1. Applying T to the vector B2 gives us minus three times B2 and applying T to the vector B3 gives us seven times B3. So B1, B2 and B3 all have this property that apply the transformation t to them, just each multiplies them by a scalar, a different scalar in each case. So in that case, we say that each of these vectors, b1, b2, b3, is an eigenvector of the linear transformation t. That means the effect of t on it is just to multiply it by a scalar multiple, it's just, it's just, it's just to multiply it by a scalar, which would not be the case for other vectors in R3, even for this particular t. 
Okay, second interpretation, which is more of a matrix interpretation, where we're looking at the matrix as B, as a transformation as being left multiplication by A, rather than it being some, you know, some, uh, some abstract linear transformation. So our relationship between A and A dash, the similarity relationship is that P inverse AP is equal to A dash. And of course, if we multiply both sides of that equation on the left by P, we can rearrange the equation to say that AP is equal to P A dash. Okay, P is a three by three matrix, which has three columns, which we're calling B1, B2, B3 as vectors in R3. A dash also has a, spe a dash has a special form. It's a diagonal matrix whose entries are two minus three, seven. So what we're saying with this description that AP is equal to P A dash is that if we take the matrix A, multiply it on the right by the columns B1, B2, B3, that we get the same outcome as if we take the matrix consisting of the columns B1, B2, B3 and multiply that on the right by the diagonal matrix 2 minus 3, 7 on the main diagonal. So looking at the left-hand side of this version, this is a 3 by 3 by a 3 by 3, and the effect of multiplying the matrix with columns B1, B2, B3 on the left by A is that we get the matrix with columns AB1, AB2, AB3, each of those is a 3 by 1 vector as well. Looking at the right-hand side, again, the effect here is that the first column of this product will just be the linear combination of B1, B2, B3 with coefficients 2, 0, 0, and that's just 2, B1. Similarly, the second column is the linear combination of those three columns with coefficients 0, minus 3, 0, that's just minus 3 times B2, and similarly 7, B3 in the third column. So again, what we're saying here is that AB1 for the first column of P, B1, is just 2 times B1, AB2 is just three, minus 3 times B2, and AB3 is 7B3. So that again, B1, B2, B3, these three vectors form a basis of R3 because the matrix P, which has them as columns, is invertible, and it's a basis consisting of eigenvectors of A, and that means exactly that the product P inverse AP would be a diagonal matrix with the corresponding eigenvalues on the main diagonal. Okay, that brings us to a few definitions, I guess, and definitions of eigenvectors in particular. We've had them on the last slide, but let's just state them um, kind of formally, just so that we have these definitions to refer to. So if T is some linear transformation from a vector space to itself, this is the context in which we can think about eigenvectors, an eigenvector of that transformation is almost a vector that's kind of almost fixed by T, but not quite because it can be moved to a scalar multiple of itself potentially. So an eigenvector of T is a non-zero element of the vector space V with the property that its image under t is just some scalar times the vector itself. So this is saying that if we think about the line, instead of the, the one dimensional subspace of v, which is spanned by v, little v, it consists of all scalar multiples of this vector, little v, that the set that, that that particular subspace is mapped into itself by the transformation t, and we say that it's an invariant subspace under that transformation t. So an eigenvector for a transformation is a, is a vector that's almost fixed by the transformation, except that it might be multiplied to just a scalar multiple of itself. The reason why we insist that eigenvectors should not be zero is because if we allowed zero to be considered as an eigenvector, then the image of the zero vector under a transformation is always a zero vector. So if the zero vector was allowed to be considered as an eigenvector, it would have to be an eigenvector for every single transformation corresponding to every single eigenvalue because the image of the zero vector under any transformation t is just the zero vector, which is also itself multiplied by any scalar. So the, you know, the case where the zero vector is mapped to itself is not really an interesting example of this concept of a vector being mapped by some transformation to a scalar multiple of itself. Okay, here's the matrix version. So if we have a square matrix, and again, this, this uh, concept only applies to the case of a square matrix. So a square matrix n by n, of course, rep re represents by left multiplication, a linear transformation from Fn to itself, from some space to itself. So an eigenvector of the matrix A is a non-zero vector with n entries with the property that the result of multiplying it on the left by A is just a scalar multiple of the vector itself. And that scalar that turns up in that description is called the eigenvalue of the matrix A to which the vector V corresponds. So as we've seen, the matrix A is diagonalizable similar to a diagonal matrix via some similarity transformation P inverse AP. If and only if there's a basis of the space Fn consisting of eigenvectors of A. 
if there is such a basis, and we don't necessarily know how to decide that question yet, if there is such a basis, then write in its elements in the columns of the matrix P will give us a matrix P for which P inverse AP is diagonal with the eigenvalues corresponding to these eigenvectors in the order in which they're written in the columns of P along the main diagonal. Equally, an abstract linear transformation T, going back to the first version of the definition, is diagonalizable exactly the same thing if the vector space V has a basis consisting of eigenvectors of T. So the two, the two definitions and the two sort of concepts of diagonalizability are exactly the same. One is transformed to the other upon the choice of a basis for the space V. Okay, so that's the, that's the concept of an eigenvector. And just to kind of get used to them, it's quite easy. To, there, are there are certain tasks involving eigenvectors that are quite straightforward once we have an understanding of matrix algebra. And one, for example, is if you're given a vector V in Fn and a matrix in N by N matrix A, it is a straightforward task to determine whether V is an eigenvector of A. So here's an example of that. Suppose we have a vector three, four, and this two by two matrix minus two, nine, eight, four. So if we want to know whether this vector is an eigenvector of that matrix, all we have to do is multiply the vector on the left by the matrix and see whether what we get is a scalar multiple of the vector that we started with. And in general, we expect that it won't be. If we make up the example off the top of our head, you know, three, four is a vector in R2, it's got coordinates, it's, it's represented by a directed line segment or by a point or whatever you like. And in principle, you hit that with some matrix, it could go anywhere. And there's no reason to expect that it would go to a scalar multiple of itself. So from the viewpoint of a vector sitting in R2 in the two-dimensional Cartesian or Euclidean plane, you know, you're a vector sitting there in R2, you have this kind of home point, home position, three, four. A matrix can come along and hit you and take you absolutely anywhere. You live on this line through the origin that consists of all the scalar multiples of the vector three, four. And so if you're multiplied by a scalar, you just move to another line, another point along that line. But if you're multiplied by a two by two matrix, you can move anywhere. So in this particular example, when we multiply three, four on the left by this matrix, we get three times minus two, eight plus four times nine, four. That turns out to be the vector 30, 40. And glancing at that, we can see, oh yeah, well actually 30, 40 is the same as what we would have got from three, four by just multiplying both entries by 10. And indeed, if somebody were to present you with these two vectors, 3, 4 and 30, 40, and ask you how you get 30, 40 from 3, 4, you'd probably say, oh, well, you'd multiply by 10. You probably wouldn't say, oh, you'd multiply by this 2 by 2 matrix A, although indeed you could do the same thing, and the effect on that vector would be the same. So from the point of view of this vector, 3, 4, this 2 by 2 matrix essentially sort of looks like the number 10 in the sense of the effect that it would have on this vector when, when, when multiplied. Okay, so to this vector, somehow that matrix looks like the number 10, if you uh, want to get into the viewpoint of a vector in, 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 the, in the plane. I'm not suggesting that they have a conscious perception of matrices, but if they did, that we would see the number 10 looking very like this two by two matrix. Okay, so that's one example. So, you know, deciding whether a given vector is an eigenvector for a given matrix is an is, is a easy task. You just, do, just calculate the product and see if it's a scalar multiple of the vector that you started with. Another thing that is not too bad, if you want to do it, is to, if you're given some vector V, like let's say this vector in R3, for example, and you want to construct a matrix that has V as an eigenvector with some specified eigenvalue, that's not hard either. And there are many, many choices for it. And I think the point of working with examples like this is kind of to get a sense of that fact that there are many choices of a matrix that has this vector as an eigenvector, even if you want to specify as well what the eigenvalue is. So let's say we want to write down a two by three matrix which is this vector as an eigenvector corresponded to the eigenvalue 28. So if we write u1, u2, u3 for the three rules of A, then what we want is that we have a matrix A with rules u1, u2, u3, with the property that when we take its product with 1, 2, 3, we get 28 times 1, 2, 3, which would have entries 28, 56, and uh, 84, which is 1, 2, 3 times 28. So that means in particular, these entries, if u1, u2, u3 are the rules of A, are just the scalar products of u1, u2, u3 with this vector v. So we want u1 to have the property that its scalar product with v should be 28. We want u2 to have the property that its scalar product with v should be 56. And we want u3 to have the property that its scalar property, its scalar product with u3 with v should be 20, should be 3 times 28, which is 84. So this, these three vectors, u1, u2, u3, the three rules of A, they're independent of each other apart from that. So we can just solve these three equations sort of independently. And certainly the easiest way to do it and the most obvious way to do it is to just choose u1 to have entries 28, 0, 0 in the first row. Then we have 28, u1. Scalar product with v is just 28 times 1. 
to the U2 and U3 to have 28 in positions two and three respectively. So that U2 scalar product with V would be 28 times two and same for U3. So then we have our A is 28 times the three by three identity matrix. And that matrix has 28 as its only eigenvalue, but, it, but every vector apart from the zero vector is an eigenvector for that matrix corresponding to 28. The matrix is just 28, 28, 28 on the main diagonal, zeros everywhere else. So that's kind of the um, easy and most obvious and kind of you know most apparent answer to this question. But there are, there are plenty of other examples. And one example is, you know, if you want to choose three rows, u1, u2, u3, so the scalar products with v are 28, 56, and 84 respectively. Another solution is use u1, for instance, is 355, five, then 3 times 1 plus 5 times 2 is 13, plus 5 times 3 is 28. So 355 five, multiplied by the column 1, 2, 3 is, is 28. If we take the second row to be 0, minus 2, 20, for instance, then the second row scalar product with v is minus 4 plus 60, so it's 56, which is what we want. And similarly there for the third one. So here's another example of a matrix which has this given v as an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue 28. So, you know, given an eigenvector, you can construct matrices that have that as an eigenvector. Given a vector and a matrix, you can decide whether the vector is an eigenvector for the matrix or not, just using the definition. The harder problem, one that we need to work with, is you know, if you're just given a matrix, how do you figure out what its corresponding eigenvectors are? And that is where we are headed. And, and I suppose also, how do you decide whether the matrix is diagonalizable, whether the space Fn or Rn has a basis consisting of eigenvectors for your matrix? And that's really what we want to do. So that's our, our goal for the next couple of lectures. Okay, so here's a problem, a harder problem. Find the eigenvectors of a matrix, give it just the matrix itself or the linear transformation. These two, you know, it's the same. Whether you're given a matrix or a linear transformation, if you're given an abstract linear transformation, write down a basis for your space and suddenly it becomes a concrete matrix and your question is the same. So here's an example. There's a three by three matrix B. So finding an eigenvector of B means finding solutions for X, Y, Z, entries of a three by one vector for which the product B by X, Y, Z is equal to the same vector X, Y, Z multiplied by some scalar lambda. And you also want that X, Y, Z are not all zero. So this is, a, this is a system of equations. It looks kind of like a linear system of equations, but it's not quite because it has this extra unknown quantity, lambda. Okay, so if lambda wasn't there, or if lambda had a specified value already, then this would be an ordinary system of linear equations in x, y, z, but really it has, sort of has four variables because it has a lambda, which is unknown. And we want to find values, potential entries, x, y, z, for a vector that satisfies this equation for a given lambda or for an unknown lambda even. So, one thing to notice is choosing x, y, z all to be equal to zero will always give us a solution to this equation because it, we have, in that case, we'll have zero, zero, zero here in the left for x, y, z. And we'll have zero, zero, zero. The product will be zero, zero, zero. So we'll have also zero, zero, zero on the right. And so zero, x, y, z all equal to zero would satisfy this matrix equation for all values of lambda. But that's not, those are not the solutions that we want to know about. We know, but we know that we want to find different solutions, unexpected ones that don't sort of exist automatically for every choice of lambda. So if lambda is regarded as a variable here, this is not a system of linear equations because we have expressions like lambda x, lambda y, lambda z, you know, products of two variables in there. It's not, it, we, we don't just have linear equations. So where to go, how to go about trying to find solutions to this? Well, the key is to find the eigenvalues first, the potential values of lambda that could give us a solution. But how are we gonna find those? You know, how, you know, potentially, potentially any real number lambda could give us some solution x, y, z here. So uh, how do we, you know, how do we go about finding the ones that that, that do, or, or or even determining how many such values of lambda there might be, or you know what properties they would have, or or anything like that? So the assertion is that that's what we're going to do. We're going to find the possible values of lambda before we find the possible values of x, y, and z. But to see why that is, uh, or at least to see some evidence to suggest why that might be somewhat of a feasible task, we're going to first of all see that the number of distinct eigenvalues of an n by n matrix cannot exceed the size of the matrix n. So just to bear in mind again, like an eigenvalue lambda of, the, of this matrix B is a number with the property that when that number is put in here in the place of lambda, that there are solutions for x, y, z other than the trivial solution of putting x, y, and z all equal to zero. Okay, so we have to get at numbers lambda that have that property somehow. So what can we do? Okay, well, first assertion is that we can't have too many different eigenvalues at claim. 
Okay, so here is a theorem. This is really the important theorem of this section and one of the really important theorems of chapter three. So what the theorem says, and it's a completely detailed proof in the lecture notes, but we're going to give a slightly more, um, I suppose, a bridged version of the proof here, but I really encourage you to read the, the, the detailed version in the lecture notes. So the theorem says that if we have an n by n matrix with entries in some field f, so think of f as being the real numbers, if you like, so a is an n by n matrix, and v1 through vk are eigenvectors of a in fn, so vectors with n entries that are eigenvectors of a, and we're going to assume that v1 through vk, so each of them has the property, each of them is a non-zero vector with the property that multiplying it by a has the same effect as multiplying it by some scalar. And we're going to get the, let the lambda 1 through lambda k denote those corresponding scalars. And the only stipulation we're going to make about v1 through to vk is that the corresponding eigenvalues for them are distinct elements of the field. Okay, so v1, v2 to vk are all eigenvectors of the matrix A corresponded to different eigenvalues. That's the hypothesis of the theorem. Okay, so we're not concerned about the case where we have multiple eigenvectors corresponded to the same eigenvalue, at least we're not considering it. We are concerned about it, but we're not considering it right now. Okay, we're in this, our hypothesis is we have some matrix and we have a bunch of eigenvectors for it that all correspond to different eigenvalues. Okay, then the conclusion is that in that situation, the set V1 through VK is a linearly independent subset of FN. In other words, none of v1 through vk can be a linear combination of the rest of them. Or equivalently, if we were to write the zero vector as a linear combination of v1 through vk, we would have to take all the coefficients to be zero. One thing to bear in mind when you're thinking about this theorem is that we're not necessarily saying that v1 through vk are all the eigenvectors of a, or that lambda 1 through lambda k are all the eigenvalues of a. We're just saying that if we have a bunch of eigenvectors of a corresponding to different eigenvalues, then those eigenvectors form a linearly independent subset of Fn. Okay, so that, that's what the theorem says. Okay, so the uh, proof works by a really neat argument. I think I hope you'll uh, like it. I, I, I think it's one of the nicest arguments we, we come across in linear algebra. So we're going to give the idea of the proof here in the lecture, just for the case where k equals two. But the uh, the version of it for k equals two kind of fully contains all the machinery that we need for the general proof, which is detailed in the lecture notes. So have a look at it there after you've thought about the k equals two case. So in the case k equals two, we have a matrix which is two by two. Sorry, pardon me. Our matrix is n by n. We have two eigenvectors of it. So we're supposing temporarily the k is two. So we're just talking about a pair of eigenvectors of some matrix where our two eigenvectors correspond to different eigenvalues, lambda one and lambda two. So our assumption is the k equals two. So we have v1 and v2. They correspond to different eigenvalues of a, lambda one and lambda two. And we are supposing that they could have a linear dependence relation. So we're supposing that we have a pair of scalars a1 and a2 for which a1 v1 plus a2 v2 equals zero for scalars a1 and a2, not a and b, sorry, in, in f. Okay, what we need to show is that this can only happen if the coefficients a1 and a2 are both equal to zero. So how are we going to do that? Like what we know about v1 and v2 is that their eigenvectors of a correspond to different eigenvalues, that's all. Okay, and we're trying to show that the only way to write zero as a linear combination of them is by taking both coefficients equal to zero. So, okay, well, what can we do with this expression a1 v1 plus a2 v2? We can multiply it on the left by a. And if we do that, so a1 and a2 are scalars, v1 and v2 are columns of length n. a is an n by n matrix. If we multiply a1 v1 plus a2 v2 on the left by the matrix a, we get a1 the scalar a1 times the matrix vector product av1 plus the scalar a2 times the matrix vector product av2. Sorry, there's a typo here that should be a2 times the matrix vector product av2 equal to zero. Now av1 is just lambda 1 v1. v1 is an eigenvector for a corresponding to lambda 1. av2 is just lambda 2 v2. So this is saying that a1 lambda 1 v1 plus a2 lambda 2 v2 is equal to zero. So in other words, if a1 and a2 are a pair of coefficients for which a1 v1 plus a2 v2 is equal to zero, then a1 lambda 1, a2 lambda 2 is another pair of scalars with the same property, that the linear combination of v1 and v2 with coefficients a1 lambda 1 and a2 lambda 2 is also the zero vector in Fn. Okay, fine, that could happen, no problem. That doesn't necessarily lead us to a conclusion. But if we take the same expression, a1 v1 plus a2 v2 equals zero, 
and just multiply it by the scalar lambda one, which is the eigenvalue of A to which V1 corresponds, then we get that A1 lambda one V1 plus A2 lambda one V2 equals zero. So we have these two expressions for zero as a linear combination of V1 and V2. The first one has coefficients A1 lambda one and A2 lambda two. The second has coefficients A1 lambda one and A2 lambda one. So if we subtract one of these expressions from the other, what we get is an expression for the zero vector as a scalar multiple of just V2. The A1 lambda one V1 terms cancel, and we get that the zero vector is A2 lambda two V2 minus A2 lambda one V2. So we're saying that the zero vector in Fn is V2, the vector V2 multiplied by the scalar A2 times lambda one minus lambda two. Here is where we're going to use the fact that lambda one and lambda two are different eigenvalues of A. The number lambda one minus lambda two is not zero because V1 and V2 were eigenvectors corresponding to different eigenvalues of A. So here we have the vector V2, which is not the zero vector because it's an eigenvector of A. So it's not the zero vector. The zero vector is not allowed to be an eigenvector of anything. Okay. So we're saying that V2 multiplied by the non-zero scalar, lambda one minus lambda two, that's not zero so far. It's a non-zero vector multiplied by a non-zero scalar. So when we multiply that by A2, we get zero. We get the vector which has zero in all entries. And the only way that can happen for a scalar A2, a non-zero vector V2, and a non-zero scalar lambda one minus lambda two is if A2 is equal to zero. So the conclusion then is A1 V1 plus A2 V2 is equal to zero, but A2 is equal to zero. So A1 V1 is equal to zero. V1 is a non-zero vector in Fn, so A1, the coefficient A1 must be zero as well. So the conclusion here is that A1 and A2 are both equal to zero, is the only way to write V1 and V2, to write zero, the zero vector as a linear combination of V1 and V2, which is exactly same that V1 and V2 are linearly independent vectors in Fn. So this is, a, this is the proof of the theorem for the case K equals two. The general case is not any harder, it uses exactly the same idea to just, you know, you have to take, take taking some linear combination of the uh, vectors v1 through vk to be equal to the zero vector with the aim of showing that all the coefficients must be zero. Do two things with that linear combination. Multiply it on the left by a, use the fact that all the eigenvectors, all the vectors vi are eigenvectors for a with different eigenvalues and multiply it on the left separately by lambda one. Just compare those two expressions. One term will drop out in the difference of them and you'll get a sort of shorter expression for uh, v2 through vk or whatever as a linear, for, uh, for, for, for zero as a linear combination of, of, of uh, just k minus one vectors. And you'll be able to argue that the only way this can be explained is if all the coefficients were originally zero. So have a look at the lecture notes for the, you know, for the, for the uh, general version, I guess, but this, this version for k equals two. If you understand that well, then you'll understand the general version as well. It doesn't involve any different ideas. Okay, a couple of consequences of this theorem, which are really important for us. What we have just shown, is that if we have a bunch of eigenvectors for an n by n matrix corresponding to different eigenvalues, then they form a linearly independent subset in Fn. We know that the maximum size, maximum number of elements in the linearly independent subset of Fn is the dimension of the space Fn, which is n. So this is telling us that we can't have eigenvectors corresponding to more than n distinct eigenvalues. If we did, they'd have to be linearly independent, but they don't have to fit inside Fn. So, a so the, an immediate corollary of the theorem is that an n by n matrix can have at most n distinct eigenvalues. Because if it had more than n of them, their corresponding eigenvectors would have to form a linearly independent set with more than n elements in, in, in a space of dimension n, which can't happen. So the corollary here is that an n by n matrix can have at most n distinct eigenvalues in a field. And the reason, well, if it had more than n, their corresponding eigenvectors would have to be a set of linearly independent vectors with more than n of, n of them in a space that only has dimension n. So the conclusion is that the number of distinct eigenvalues of a matrix, in a, of an n by n matrix, it, it cannot exceed n. It can be less than n, but it can't exceed n. And I guess this maybe gives us sort of some sort of suggestion that going back to that equation that we were trying to solve there two slides ago, you have to find the eigenva eigenvectors of this matrix B, you have to solve this system which has a lambda in it as well as an x, y, z. We're looking for values of lambda, which give us non-zero solutions for x, y, z. 
So it's not obvious in advance that any lambda could do that trick. What we're saying now is this is a three by three matrix. So there can be at most three values of lambda for which this equation has solutions x for x, y, z, not all equal to zero. Okay, we still don't know how to find these potentially up to three values of lambda, but we do know that lambda can't be just anything. So there's no point in trying to guess values of lambda, for example. You know, whatever you pick won't be, won't be one of the three if you'd pick some sort of random real number. Uh, but we have to now next see how we can get at these particular values of lambda that are going to be eigenvectors of our matrix. And that'll be the content of the next couple of lectures. So thank you very much, everybody, and see you next time for lecture 18.